Welcome to Overanalyzing Vlogs, where I think too much about something. Or do I? I want to talk about being a YouTuber and some things about it that bug me slightly. A while ago I wrote an article for Novara Media in which I talked about the business side of YouTube, and in it I speculated that there might be such thing as a YouTube trade union someday. And then, not long after that, I heard about the Internet Creators Guild, which has been invented by Hank Green, a very big digital cheese and business entrepreneur who you've probably heard of, and they say that their mission is to connect, educate, represent, and support people who make stuff online. And I was like, yeah, YouTube trade union, somebody better answer that phone because I called it. But having looked a little bit more into it, I think I got a bit ahead of myself. And I think that the ICG actually symbolizes a number of problems that I have with YouTube. To start off, I'll tell you a little bit about it. They explicitly say on their website that they're not a trade union, and you have to pay to join it, but the board of directors who control the organization are appointed, not elected by the members. The members themselves can give feedback and suggestions, but they have no voice within the organization that has to be respected. In a personal email to me, their executive director, Laura Chernikov, said that the reason for that is it would be way too easy for someone with a little bit of money to come in and buy memberships for all their employees and then effectively control the entire organization. Hank Green himself said in an interview with Tim Schmoyer that he doesn't like viewing the relationship between YouTube and creators as antagonistic. He says, YouTubers aren't coal miners, we don't work for anyone, that's not how it works. We make content, we license that content to YouTube. From these comments by Hank and Laura, and from the structure of the ICG, I think it embodies a particular political and economic viewpoint that I disagree with. Uh, it's a viewpoint that's present quite widely at the moment, and uh, it's well-intentioned, but it's bourgeois, technocratic liberalism. And here I'm using liberalism in the British sense of uh, not radical, not transformative, rather than the American sense of the word liberal, which means like anyone left of Sauron. I'll give you some examples. Hank and Laura say that the ICG is not going to do any kind of collective bargaining and it's not going to do any kind of industrial action because they say YouTubers don't need that because we're not like coal miners. But because the power in the ICG is concentrated at the top, it isn't the creators collectively that have made that decision. The directors have decided that for them. The creators haven't come together and decided that their problems merit this kind of attention or this kind of action. That, that's already been done by the directors. And if they're concerned about rich corporate types taking over the ICG, I mean, okay, assuming for a moment that that's a thing that might happen, like, is there any evidence of that? But assuming that it might happen, there's a brilliant book by Harsha Warlier called Undoing Border Imperialism, in which she talks about how you build a group that represents marginalized people or vulnerable people. Uh, she's not talking about YouTube creators, obviously, but some of the same principles apply. And she says that one thing that liberal groups tend to forget a lot is accountability, is being accountable to the people that you're trying to help. Not just in the sense that they can write to you and give you feedback in like a Slack group, but in the sense that you actually give them the power to direct the movement and say, we're gonna use this tactics and do this. The concern about rich corporate types taking over the ICG <laughs> kind of overlooks the fact that rich business owners are already controlling it because they're the ones who founded it and designed it such that they maintain the power. Speaking of power, because the members have no binding voice, any power that the ICG has to affect change, like change YouTube policy, doesn't come from the creators. It comes from the power of the personal brands of the directors and the people who run it. So if the ICG can do anything really useful, which maybe it can, it can do that not because creators have come together and pooled their strength, but because YouTube and other organizations feel that they want to listen to Hank and Laura and the other people who run it. It is true that YouTube is not like coal mining, but one thing that I've been saying for a little while now is that people say YouTube is the Wild West and it's the new business frontier and oh, all the new business models, are all, all the new ones have replaced all the old ones. It's not, really. I mean, some things are different about YouTube, but it's actually inherited a lot of the same old problems as old capitalist industry. And it is unmistakably capitalist business. The true product of YouTube isn't videos, it's ad space. YouTube makes profit by selling the right to display adverts 
on creators' videos, and creators themselves get about 55% of the money from that. We aren't paid wages like old-school coal mining capitalism, but the most important means of production, the YouTube site itself, is still privately owned, surplus value is still extracted to become capital and being reinvested in making more profit, and the products, ad space, are still sold in a market with creators being paid less than their full value. This is all like textbook definition of capitalism stuff. It's true that not everybody who uploads videos monetizes them, and it's also true that the YouTube staff, or at least all the ones I've met, genuinely really do care about making good content, but that doesn't change the fact that YouTube is teleologically and structurally capitalist. And insofar as it is capitalist, the relationship between capital and labourers, creators, is inherently antagonistic. Hank rightly points out that we still own all the videos we upload to YouTube, and he's right, we do, but like I said, the videos aren't the real product, it's the ad space that's the product. And by uploading videos to YouTube and monetizing them, we give YouTube license to sell that product as they see fit. The fact that we technically retain ownership of the content is a way for YouTube to avoid liability for things that people upload on the channel. Like if you uploaded a video of a murder and monetized it and it got loads and loads of views, then YouTube can say, oh, that's not our fault, it's like murder someone, like we don't own that, they own the content, responsibility is all on them but they still get to keep all the money they got from the adverts. This is a very, very fashionable move at the moment. Right now, companies really enjoy giving all the responsibility to the workers, but keeping the profits for themselves. Companies like uh, Deliveroo and Uber are really fond of saying that, oh, our drivers, they're not employees, they're technically self-employed, they just use our platform, so they don't need things like workers' rights and a living wage but we still get to keep all the profit that they make for us. Companies really like keeping the profits, but making sure that you have all the responsibility, and YouTube is absolutely no exception. They have this new thing now called YouTube Heroes, which you might have heard of. You can sign up for it, and then you can like moderate comment sections, or you can flag videos that are illegal, and you can earn points by doing it, and it's all completely unpaid. You can unlock higher tiers when you get enough points, but the only things you unlock are like more tools, more ability to do more unpaid work for Google. And if you're doing this YouTube Heroes thing, then you are attracting more users to the site and you are making the site more advertiser-friendly. So you are generating profit for Google. Rather than hire more staff to do the job, YouTube has outsourced the work to you. And yeah, okay, this might have the added benefit of making YouTube a more pleasant place to be, and that's great, but Foucault would remind us that it's not enough to just look at the stated goals of the system. You have to look at who really benefits and loses from it. So who benefits from the ICG? Well, I've no doubt that its members are going to find it really useful because it looks really cool. Some other people benefit from it as well, though. Members get discounted tickets to VidCon, the big YouTube convention. They have a strong incentive to buy tickets. VidCon is for profit, and it's run by Hank Green. And when the press talks to the Internet Creators Guild, it's not the workaday average members that they talk to, it's the board of directors and the front public-facing people who run it. They get to be seen as the face of the YouTube community, and that enhances the power of their personal brands. Just because the organization itself is non-profit doesn't mean there aren't ways of harnessing it for some people's profit. So not only is the power concentrated at the top, certain kinds of benefits stay at the top as well. And who loses out? Well, that's not actually that hard to discover. Under any liberal system, the people who are losing out are usually the ones who are not mentioned at all. And to be fair, this is a problem I have with YouTube much more generally. A lot of the chat is about creators, and it's by and for creators. How do we make creators get a better deal? How do we benefit creators? And that's fine, but there's very little, I mean, like, almost no, acknowledgement of the material and political conditions that have to be in place for us to be YouTubers. As an example, YouTube is owned by Google. YouTubers, including me, make money for Google. Google, and other tech companies, is contributing to the gentrification of San Francisco, which is forcing poor black and Latinx people out of their homes. Google also habitually moves billions of dollars to Bermuda to avoid paying taxes on it. And we, YouTubers, are complicit in that. We benefit from that. As another example, there's a metal called tantalum, which is a key ingredient in laptops and cameras, which you need to be a YouTuber. Tantalum is refined from an ore called coltan. And coltan is a conflict mineral. 
The extraction of coltan is doing massive political and ecological damage in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And that damage, which is, you know, people dying and having horrible times, is disproportionately borne by women and people of colour. A strong, democratic Internet Creators Guild could hold Google to account for the nasty things that it does with the profit that we help generate for it. And it could also educate YouTubers about our place in the world and who has to suffer and die in order for us to be able to do our jobs. And I absolutely include myself in this. Like, I am complicit in and benefit from these systems and I probably don't do enough to distance myself from them. But in the YouTube community at large, like, the network of creators seems to be pretty self-serving and there's not... At most of the YouTube events, conventions and so on I've been to, there's no acknowledgement of the fact that for us to be able to do our jobs requires, at least in part and for right now, violence against poor people and the continued exploitation of the global south. And right now it doesn't really look like the ICG is gonna be engaging with any of that. In the interview that I mentioned earlier on, Tim Schmoyer says, uh, this will turn into something good as opposed to just being some sort of political organisation. And that's a sentiment that Hank and Laura in the interview agree with, but I think that wrongly assumes that you can in fact separate technology and politics. Politics is the distribution of power, and as we've just seen, the technology YouTubers use to do our jobs requires that some people do not have power over their lives. So you can't separate technology and politics. To my mind, the ICG and YouTube more generally doesn't reflect what philosophers Akugo Emajulu and Callum McGregor call radical digital citizenship. By staying, quote, neutral on these questions and not engaging with them, we don't destroy unjust or oppressive political structures. At best, we enable a slightly greater number of people to share in the spoils of that evil. Evgeny Morozov writes that when we pretend we can separate technology and politics, we are not really trying to solve the problem, only to deploy our tools, coding and information to redefine the problem in the most convenient but least ambitious way. The ambitions of the ICG, according to its goals, are to share stories, advise, clarify, explain, provide case studies, all stuff to do with giving people information, but Emajulu and McGregor and Morozov remind us that the big problems in the world can't be solved by just giving people more information. Not only is that not going to solve the problem, but it's also inherently technocratic, because the people who have access to the information are the ones who are going to end up leading rather than letting the people who are the victims of the system lead the way, demand the kind of change that they want, supporting them in a way that makes you accountable to them. This is the part where I start walking back from some of my criticisms. None of this means that you shouldn't join the ICG. It looks cool, it looks interesting, and if you want to join, awesome, go ahead. It's also not even a year old, so there's still time for it to get into its stride and figure out what it's gonna do. Since YouTube loves drama, I should also say that obviously none of this is a personal slight against Hank or Laura, who I am reliably assured are lovely. To sum up my position on this though, there was a panel at the last Summer in the City, the big YouTube convention in the UK, called Doing Good on YouTube, and Hannah Witten, who is also lovely by the way, said that we shouldn't be afraid to get political on the platform, I was in the audience that day and I applauded that. I, I was very inspired by that sentiment. I think it's absolutely true. I think that YouTubers and the YouTube staff and the Internet Creators Guild as well could afford to get a little bit more political, by which I mean concerned with the distribution of power. But maybe I'm just reading too much into it. Or am I?